Good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Geister. I am the Chief Executive Officer for Hillcrest Hospital South here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And joining me is Dr. Jonathan Israel. Dr. Hey, Israel. Israel. Good to see you, sir. Dr. Israel um, is our newest urologist, and we wanted to take this opportunity to uh, get to ask Dr. Israel some questions, both personal questions as well as professional questions, to get to know him better and a little bit about what he does. So, Dr. Israel, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, wanted to touch base before we get into talking about your practice as a urologist, et cetera. Let's start at simple. Tell us about yourself. Give us your background, what you enjoy doing the most during your free time, and also why Tulsa? Yeah. So, born and raised in Virginia. Um, went to both undergraduate and medical school at the University of Virginia. So, very strong ties to the University of Virginia. Um, and then I decided that I wanted to do training in New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, at that time, I was part of the combined program, both LSU and Oshner, which for me was a, a very strong draw because you had both the community side of things and then you had the private side of things. Um, so I trained at a bunch of different institutions down there. Um, and actually, you know, that's where I met the love of my life. And then we moved back to Virginia after I finished in New Orleans. Um, back to Charlottesville actually and we're there for a couple of years I had some private practice there and at that time you know we just were looking for other options we were kind of looking to see is there something out there that that would be more applicable to us and we ended up getting very lucky got connected to Hillcrest and came out to Tulsa Oklahoma and really for us it was wow this is amazing it was not what we were expecting at all when we first landed we don't have any ties to Oklahoma but when we landed, we really just felt that there was a strong sense of community here in Tulsa. We liked the people, we liked interacting with people. When we were walking on the street, just kind of touring, you know, both downtown, midtown, and, and as we went further and further south, people were just really nice. People took an interest in you. Waiters would ask you personal questions and, you know, wanted to make sure that you were happy. People realized that we weren't from here and were very excited that, you know, we had the potential of moving to Tulsa. So. You know, we fell in love with the city, and then from a professional standpoint, this job just has a lot of growth opportunity for me professionally. So I'm really excited to be starting both at South and at Hillcrest, Maine, um, and I'm just very excited to be seeing patients and, and getting back into uh, the swing of things as a urologist here. That's wonderful, Dr. Israel. And I'll, I'll ask you a question too, from a free time perspective, what are those some of those things that you enjoy doing? Yeah, outside of the hospital, it's family time. I have a okay. six-year-old and one-year-old, and so they take up a lot of my time, which is amazing. Um, but whenever I have a free moment, I'm very big outside. I like to go running. Um, don't run as much as I used to, um, but I really, really enjoy running. And then, you know, exercise to eat. Um, and so the food scene here is phenomenal. We've really loved it. We've been very surprised and very much delightfully surprised at how good the food is. Um, so exercise just to make sure that I can <laughs> Absolutely. Now, country music fan? You know, I do. We, I really got into country music when I was in college. Um, but honestly, I'm one of those people that can kind of listen to anything. Nice. So if it's, on the, if it's on either the TV or the radio, I'll listen to it. Very good. And so Dr. Israel's now checked all the boxes to be an Oklahoman, <laughs> um, having grown up here. So very good, Dr. Israel. Let me ask you this. Let's get a little bit more specific into uh, the profession itself. Did you always want to be a physician? Is it something that was an inspiration? Walk us through, why did you decide to pick the career field you did? Yeah, medicine for me has always been something that's been on my mind. My mom was a nurse, um, so I kind of had that exposure from, from a young kind of child growing up. Really for me, I was very interested in science. Um, I loved science from middle school to high school. Probably my biggest you know, influence in high school was my biology teacher, um, and he really kind of introduced me to this world and then when I got to college I realized really quickly you know what are you going to do with a science degree how are you going to apply it um, and I realized that I loved science I liked dealing with people I liked helping people and it just kind of was a natural fit to, to go to medical school um, it wasn't easy obviously it was challenging to get into medical school but Absolutely. it really kind of hit all those high points for me of you know patient interaction you get you know, the investigation, trying to figure out what's wrong, and then most importantly, helping someone. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people wonder too, when a, a, a physician decides to become a surgeon versus going into internal medicine or a non-surgical subspecialty, what was that aha moment for you? When did you say, I wanna go surgical, and then when did you wanna subspecialize in urology? 
Yeah, so for me, it all kind of happened in my third year, and I love it for me to be this memorable moment of I was, <laughs> you know, in the OR at 2 a.m. with the urologists, but it was actually my roommate and one of my best friends, um, he was doing a urology rotation, and at that time, I had no idea what urology was, um, and he pretty much told me, one, you're going to love the personalities of the people that are working in the field. Two, you're going to like the patients that are seeing doctors in this field. And three, you're going to like the technology. Mm. And so actually it was that moment that made me start to look into what urology was, what do they do, and how do they do it. And so third year for me was kind of that exploration process. And I realized quickly that I liked working with my hands. I liked the ability to intervene and, and operate quickly if something need, if someone needed that to be done. But at the same time, the nice thing about urology is that you do have this long-term relationship with the patient. You see some of these patients for every three months, mm -hmm. for five, 10, 15, 20 years. So you get to form a really strong relationship and you realize very quickly that that's important. And for me, that was really important to have both the, yes, you can take someone to the operating room right away and fix a problem quickly, but at the same time, as urologists, we have long-term follow-up with our patients, and you get to form that really great dynamic. So you talked a lot about patient care, and I know uh, your mom obviously was a very much an influence to you in terms of going into medicine in general. Walk through a little bit, what do you enjoy the most about patient care? Or maybe put another way, when patients come to see Dr. Israel, what can they expect? Yeah, so for me, you know, what can they expect? I think the most important thing as a physician is to be honest. Um, I think patients really appreciate it. Sometimes patients don't realize that they want someone to be honest up front. Um, and when I say that, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you can kind of sugarcoat things. Sure. I feel like in my experience, when you're up front with a patient and kind of tell them exactly what's going on, they're, you know, on board. Um, and patients realize that, okay, this is a serious problem. Okay, this is something that needs to be fixed quickly. Um, so in that aspect, you know, that's my mentality of treating patients. Um, in terms of what I enjoy the most, obviously m when my goals and the patient's goals completely align and we reach those goals together. Nice. So we can fix a problem either surgically or medically, but there's nothing more you know, satisfactory from a physician standpoint is having a patient who's walked in previously with a problem, who's then walking out an office visit or two later saying, you fixed me. Yeah. And they have that smile on the face. And a lot of the times the family members are happy. And so it's that kind of dynamic of not only do you help the patient, but when it comes to urology, a lot of the times you're helping everyone else in the family. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I like a point that you brought up a second ago. Um, you mentioned that you were not sure exactly what all conditions a urologist treated. So from a practical standpoint to our audience today, walk us through, what am I going to go see a urologist for? Yeah, there, it, it's a small field, but we do a breadth of things. I like to consider urologists the plumbers of the human body from a <laughs> urinary standpoint. Okay. So you deal with anything related to urination. So for men, sometimes that's they have problems with peeing. They're not peeing like they used to when they were 15, 20, 30 years old. You deal with erectile dysfunction. You deal with cancers related to urologic organs. So kidney cancer, prostate cancer, bladder cancer, testicular cancer. From the female perspective, you deal with incontinence. Mm -hmm. um, especially as women get older, you have stress incontinence women leak when they cough, laugh, sneeze, stand up, urge incontinence. They're sitting there and all of a sudden they have this strong urge to urinate. Um, you deal with the pediatric patient population, so little kids, do they have problems with urination? Um, and then you also deal with trauma and reconstruction. If someone is in an accident and they have a problem with a urologic organ, we're the ones that get called to help assess and fix that. And typically, if, if I'm a urology patient, based on the, de the descriptions that you provided, what's the easiest way, if I'm struggling with any of those, those symptoms, what's the easiest way to get to you? In all honesty, for a lot of our patients, it's they go to their primary care doctor okay. first, and then they'll get referred to us. But a lot of the times, as a urologist, if you have a problem and you just say, listen, I'd like to just talk to a urologist about this, we're more than happy to help. Okay. And then if I end up needing to see you for one of the conditions you mentioned, walk through what's a what's an office visit? What can I expect when I come into the office to see you for the first time? Yeah, so for us a lot of it will depend on what you're there to see us for, but a lot of the times we're gonna want to take a look at your urine to see if there's any infection, if there's any blood, if there's something abnormal with the urination. You'll expect a lot of pertinent questions about okay. your issue. So if that involves sexual dysfunction, you'll get a lot of sexual dysfunction questions. If it's about urinary tract infections, about urinary tract issues. So you'll get a very 
focused kind of a history that a lot of the times primary care doctors don't have time for. Gotcha. We're there specifically for one, two, sometimes three issues. And then a physical exam, um, depending on men, women, a pelvic exam, a rectal exam to feel your prostate. And then a lot of the times, depending on if there's something else going on, maybe we'll need some blood work. Maybe we'll need to do some imaging studies. All that will be discussed, obviously, with your urologist when you're there, but expect a thorough visit for the first time that you visit. And then I think another question, a lot of, of uh, customers, patients, there's always the, the question about price and price sensitivity and uh, healthcare uh, billing system is so complex as it is. So what are some of the common procedures that a urologist would do in the office setting versus when you decide I need to take that patient back sure. to surgery. So obviously as urologists we're, we're very concerned with patient cost. No one wants to bankrupt a patient to fix a problem. Um, so we're really trying to push towards doing as much as we can in the clinic because almost always it's cheaper to do a procedure in the clinic sure. than it is to be done in the operating room. Most common procedures in the clinic, something called cystoscopy, where we actually put a small camera in the urethra. In men, that's the penis. In women, it's kind of right by the vagina. Look through the urethra and look in the bladder. It's almost always done with local anesthesia. For almost all patients, the most challenging part is the mental exam before <laughs> the sure. actual test. Because it's quick. Typically, it only lasts for a couple of minutes. Um, we do biopsies in our clinic, so rectal biopsies for the prostate. Um, we will do vasectomies in the office. Um, we will do a test called urodynamics where you can evaluate the form and function of how the bladder is working. Um, so those are the major procedures that we'll do in the office. And you talked a lot, a lot of people suffer from urinary tract infection. So walk through, what, what is a urinary tract infection? How can people avoid it? And then what are, they, what are the most common ways to treat it whenever they go through it? Yeah, so urinary tract infections can affect everyone, both men, women, and children. Um, well, urinary tract infections can be different based on the patient. Um, for most people, it typically presents with burning, urinary frequency, urinary urgency, bowel smelling urine. A lot of the times it's detected by having your doctor tell you to pee into a cup and then they'll test it. Sometimes we can send it off for a culture to see exactly what's growing in the urine. For most patients, they typically will start with their primary care doctor. You know, hey doc, I'm having an infection, can you help? It's usually gets referred to the urologist when it's a little bit more complicated. It's happening more often. There's fever, you've been hospitalized for it. And for us as urologists, the big point of you know, trying to investigate infections is, is there some sort of a structural problem? Is there some reason why the urine's getting backed up that's causing an infection to occur? So common causes um, from a structural standpoint, a kidney stone can cause urinary tract infections. A blockage or something called hydronephrosis of the kidney can cause infections. Sexual activity can cause infections. For men, a big prostate or problems with urination can cause urinary tract infections. You can sometimes have narrowing of the tubes. There are small tubes that drain the kidneys. There's a tube that drains the bladder. Sometimes those can be narrowed, which can cause infections. In terms of preventing infections, if you can fix or correct the structural abnormality, for the vast majority of patients, those infections will go away. For men, you shouldn't typically see infections. So usually you have a warning sign if you have a man that has an infection as to some sort of a structural problem. Mm. For females, unfortunately, just because of how the urinary tract is developed in females, they have a very short and straight urethra, so they're more predisposed or prone to get infections. Especially as they get older, they have less estrogen to protect against infections. And in that case, we have treatments to restore the estrogen, to restore the natural kind of body habitat for good bacteria to prevent those infections. So it can be tough, it can be challenging to figure out, but it's very rewarding when you have someone that comes in with an infection every two to three weeks to get them infection free without antibiotics. That's great. Well, and I think too, you mentioned another uh, common thing, kind of the preventative side. You hear a lot of stuff right now in the news. What are the things that patients can do in order to prevent something worse from happening down the line? So uh, prostate screening exam, that's something that is a very common uh, yeah. thing that all men go through. Walk through, what are the specifics? When, when do we need to get those? What can we expect? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? What are the next steps whenever you see something that uh, you don't necessarily want to see? Sure. So prostate cancer and prostate cancer screening is obviously a very you know, 
hot topic in urology and especially with primary care physicians. There have been recent guidelines that have been put out by primary care docs and the urologists have kind of responded. For me, really, it's a shared discussion. Okay, you know, I have no problem just talking to patients about, hey, do you even want to be screened for this? You know, guidelines for us, do you have a family history of prostate cancer? Any dads, brothers, uncles? If you do, then you're more likely to have prostate cancer. As you get older, you're more likely to have prostate cancer. So I typically will start screening in most of my patients at 55 years old if they're interested in screening. Now, what does screening mean? Screening for me typically involves two tests. One is a rectal exam done in clinic, and really what you're doing is you're feeling the prostate. You're feeling one side of the prostate, and is there anything abnormal? Do you have a lump, a bump, a nodule? Is it firm or fixed? If you have any of those things, those can be warning signs that maybe something else is going on. Then we have blood tests. The most common blood test is something called the PSA, and it's usually done annually, and that result kind of lets us know what's the overall health picture. It's not the greatest test ever. It's not gonna tell you, hey, if your PSA is X, you have cancer. It just leads to a likelihood, which is where that shared decision-making comes into play. So for me, I almost never base everything off of one test or one exam. I like to talk to the patient and really let them know because if a patient says, listen, this is abnormal, I'm concerned, I'd like to take it to the next step, you're almost always talking about a biopsy. And what that involves is we put a probe in the rectum to measure the prostate. We see, hey, what does the prostate look like under ultrasound? And then we actually stick a little needle in the prostate a couple times. Usually it's about 12 times in the areas most suspicious for where cancer exists. That test then goes off to the pathologist who will look at it under the microscope and say, yes, there's cancer here. No, there's not cancer here. Or, oh, we're not really sure. Let's do some more studies. Once you get diagnosed with prostate cancer, that's a very serious discussion. Not all cancers when it comes to the prostate are treated the same. And at that point, you know, you can't ever have one specific recommendation for everyone. So it's a very tailored approach to the patient, to their family, to their goals and expectations. And that's really where I think urology is most interesting and most fascinating because you can have a hundred patients with the same clinical picture, but it's a hundred different patients with mm. their own goals and wishes. And that's where it's fun. That's where you get to talk about the pros and the cons of every treatment modality. Well, and I'll kind of I'll kind of end it on this too, because we go from screening to then what happens whenever uh, we're at the highest acuity or the, the most sick state. So prostate cancer, walk through uh, your decision-making in terms of how do I manage prostate cancer? How aggressive is prostate cancer? What are the things as patients you advise your patients whenever they, whenever you find out and have to tell them about sure. it? Sure. So, you know, the first thing that you have to understand about prostate cancer is not all prostate cancers are the same. So just because you had a friend or a family member be diagnosed with prostate cancer and they had a treatment done, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be for you. So for me, the first thing that you look at is what's the Gleason score? And that's the actual score for how aggressive does this cancer look under the microscope? It's kind of broken down into what we call risk categories. Um, you have very low risk, low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk prostate cancer. And based on that is really what guides your treatment modalities. For a lot of patients, really what we call now active surveillance is the method of choice for low mm -hmm. or very low risk prostate cancers. And really what that entails is having continued follow-up with the patient, monitoring their blood PSA levels, monitoring their rectal exams, repeating biopsies as needed to see if this cancer will get more aggressive or not. And the reason for that is the treatment for prostate cancer has side effects like anything else. And you don't wanna take a patient that has a low risk prostate cancer that doesn't have the potential to cause them harm down the line, treat them and then cause them harm due to the treatment. Gotcha. So that's one method. If you come to see a urologist, we'll also talk about surgery. Now there are different ways to treat the prostate surgically. The most common form this day and age is now with the robot, which involves small incisions um, to take out the prostate. The reason why a lot of urologists use the robot, number one, it's better on the patient. Less pain, less complications. Patients typically will get out of the hospital a lot sooner than if they had an open surgery. The third option for treating them is radiation therapy. That's not done by the urologist, that's done by a radiation oncologist who we work closely with to make sure patients are appropriately treated. So in terms of what patients need treatment, again, that really depends on what the patient kind of looks like, what their clinical picture is, and then what their prostate cancer picture looks like. The most important thing that I tell all of my patients is, listen, 
you're the one that's dealing with this diagnosis, you need to feel comfortable with the treatment plan. It doesn't make any sense for me to say, you need this, no discussion, you're out the door, we're doing that. And then the patients say, I'm not really sure if that's right for me. So the most important thing for my patients is peace of mind, that they feel like they're invested, they feel like this is the best treatment for them, and then they're happy with the outcome. That's fantastic. Dr. Israel, this has uh, been so, so uh, beneficial. I think it's first and foremost great to get to know you better, yeah. but also to hear your explanations to a lot of questions I think our community and all communities have when it comes to the role and services that you play within the health system. So thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Israel is accepting new patients. Uh, he started with us earlier this month, and um, if you saw anything, uh, he's as genuine as it gets. So please uh, look into Dr. Israel. We appreciate so much your time today. Thanks again. Thank you.